Chapter 1191 Harvest? What? Hansen stared at Dragon King and asked, Then why would the Azura Sutra be on your scale? Were you best buds with Azura? Um, Dragon King, for once, had been rendered speechless. Hansen was starting to understand what had happened. Dragon King had most likely been a traitor. He had committed a betrayal, and now, in his current state, he was afraid of seeing the other generals from that time. Trust me. Once more, I plead you. Azura King is in the fourth god sanctuary, but I know a trace of his lineage is still here in the third god sanctuary. If we get this person to practice the Azura Sutra, we can remove the vines. Before Dragon King could finish speaking, Hansen put him away. I don't need you to find Azura. Hansen knew of someone else who could practice the Azura Sutra. Hansen wondered just how strong Zero had become with the skill. But he also wondered why the Azura Sutra was practically the same as the Falsified Sky Sutra. And also, why could only the Shura fully learn it? Are all these tangents connected somehow? Hansen had a lot to mull. The concept was not entirely impossible or even implausible, as he now knew that creatures of the Sanctuary were capable of entering the Alliance. Bauer was the latest example. She was born in the Sanctuary, but she could go to the Alliance and back with no issue. If the Shura were the descendants of this Azura, shouldn't that mean they would be able to enter the sanctuaries? But it is a well-known fact they cannot. This was quite the head-scratcher for Hansen to contemplate. Something else weighed on Hansen's mind, too, baby ghost. No matter what Hansen asked about Blood Legion, he was given the same response, you are not Blood Legion, so I cannot tell you. Hansen was desperate to find out why Blood Legion had kidnapped Han Jingji, but try as he might, the only person he knew who could give him an answer, refused to. Ching Jun had been grievously damaged following the ordeal with the vines. But the damage was not entirely physical. She was Sky King's child, yet Sky King showed no remorse in attempting to sacrifice her with the rest. She was heartbroken by the betrayal. After trying it out, Hansen was unable to use Zero's falsified sky powers to remove the vines. So, for now, they all had to remain stuck inside the bottle. If Hansen was able to save them all, Hansen did not know whether or not the creatures would pay him heed and listen to what he commanded, either. As such, he decided to speak with each of them, engage which creature he might be able to trust the most. Hansen asked Moment Queen to move the shelter once more, hoping it would move them closer towards Holy Sword Shelter. Xie Qing King and the Silver Fox were supposed to be in that place. Hansen knew the Thorn Forest well by now, and he knew where Holy Sword Shelter lay. He was worried about the Silver Fox, though. Hansen still missed his companionship a great deal, and the Silver Fox's absence in his escapades was still sorely felt. Even now, Hansen would occasionally brush his own shoulder in the mistaken belief that the Silver Fox was right there. For now, though, Hansen had to return to the Alliance. He wanted to pick up a new Hypergeno art. Due to his inability to break the mirror, he knew he needed a move with a bit more of a power focus. Saving money was great but it wasn't the best when used in a one-on-one -on -one fight, particularly so if it was in close-quarter combat. Furthermore, after his duel with Sky King, he had become infinitely more fascinated with the powers of bending and manipulating space. He had 100 space geno points, too, so he thought there'd be no harm in trying out an ability related to the element of space. There weren't many hypergeno arts associated with the space element, however. There were only a dozen S-class skills for him to choose from. And what was more, they were pretty weak. There was one that was named Space Blade, but it only cut enemies slightly. Hansen wanted to be able to properly bend and warp the dimension. He wanted something that would allow him to really grip the fabric of space and manipulate it to his own will, just as Sky King did. After much perusing, Hansen found an S-class Hypergeno art that attracted him far more than all the others. This Hypergeno art was called Hyperspace. It was a fairly modern skill, too and it wasn't something derived from some musty, aged text of yore. It was a skill that had been derived from the teachings and learnings of modern science. It was widely believed that humans live in a three-dimensional reality, but according to the theory of relativity, that was not entirely the case. The concept of three dimensions of space, alongside one dimension of time, produced the concept of humans living in a four-dimensional continuum. But there were believed to be 11 dimensions in total. Hyperspace dealt with the time axis a lot, though. So, it was a hypergeno art most closely associated with the element of time. Hansen wanted the skill not because it was strong, 
but because of how refreshing it looked. It inspired him in more ways than one. For most people, though, hyperspace was more theory than anything. You needed time and space talents to learn it effectively. Few people could fully learn it, but even if they did, it wasn't very effective. A hypergeno art like that, though, employed techniques not even the fiercest of super creatures could. Hansen thought he needed a space hypergeno art only, but he was wrong. I already have 100 space king spirit geno points. Moment Queen is associated with the element of time, so if I could get 100 time geno points off her, I'd be all set. I'd be proficient in both talents, and I could learn that hypergeno art. Hansen paused his thoughts for a moment, and then went on to think, I was gone from the underground shelter for some years. She must have obtained many Geno points in my time away. Perhaps it is only fair that she share the wealth. Chapter 1192 You were too weak. Hansen didn't buy hyperspace in the end, since he didn't meet the ideal time King Spirit Geno point requirement yet. He still wanted to buy a hyper Geno art that dealt simple, not fancy high damage, too. But he decided that could wait for the time being so he could consult Moment Queen about her lending him time Geno points. Back in the shelter, Bauer leaped off the back of the white bear to go and sit on Hansen's shoulder. She was wearing cowboy boots, a cowboy hat, and had a large pair of aviator sunglasses on. Hansen patted her head and then went to the martial hall. There, Hansen walked up to Moment Queen and said, I have learned a new technique. Care to practice with me? I am too weak. Why don't you ask your blue dinosaur to help you out? Moment Queen said. He is too strong for me, so I can't practice with him. Besides, I'm in the mood to interact with you, Hansen said. Moment Queen's eyes twitched, suggesting she was easy for him to bully. Moment Queen lowered her head and answered. Fine. Hansen asked her, have you heard of this fellow called the King? Yes, I have, Moment Queen answered with immediacy. In her heart, the mere calling of that name prompted her to think. Ah, the king who must one day become a most glorious emperor. Does he use a skill that involves coins? Hansen asked. I think so, Moment Queen said. Have you seen it in action? Hansen asked. No, I haven't. Moment Queen had developed a compulsion to lie, it seemed, as she snickered to herself on the inside, saying, Of course I have, you dimwit. As if I tell you about it. It is good that you have not seen it, then. I have a power that involves the use of coins, too. I bet I'm better than the king with them, too, Hansen boasted, baiting her. Hearing this, Moment Queen thought to herself, Pa, you are nothing compared to the king, you imbecile. Moment Queen despised Hansen with every bone in her body, but she was bound to him in service. So, for now, she had no choice but to comply with Hansen's desire to practice. Hansen could sense how much she hated him, but that was fine. She used to lie about possessing the space element, when it was in fact time and she seemed to have some relation to a lot of emperors. If she wasn't useful, he would have killed her after her last attempt of betrayal. Hansen reached out his right hand and made a coin appear between two of his fingers. Moment Queen had already been shocked. She didn't expect he'd even be able to formulate a coin out of thin air. Of course, that could be little more than an illusion, just something for show. It didn't illustrate Hansen's true proficiency, power, and expertise with the coin technique he wished to show her. Her face soon changed, though. After a small amount of time elapsed, the coin was able to gather up a vast amount of scary, wretched power. Moment Queen was able to detect in detail how much power was being amassed. If it kept on going, Hansung could kill her. Have I finally outlived my usefulness? Has the time come for him to kill me? Is this the day? Is this how I'm going to go out? Will my existence be snuffed out by this monetary monstrosity? Moment Queen's mind was riddled with such thoughts. But if Hansen truly wanted to kill her, he'd only have to use his mind. Still, the thought remained. And the stronger the power in that coin became, the more her anxiety and nervousness grew. Pang. The coin flew towards Moment Queen like a golden arrow, as the dimension around it twisted with the flight. Moment Queen's face changed as she realized that the power in that coin could easily kill her. She had initially believed she could fake an injury and end a session prematurely. But when the coin flew, pretending an injury was off the table. If she wasn't outright killed, she'd at the very least be rendered a crippled mess. Moment Queen teleported a few hundred meters away. She believed she had managed to dodge the attack, but the coin's flight halted in midair. The coin twirled and twirled, as if trying to suck her back to it. 
Moment Queen tried her best to escape that power, but the coin had been brewing for so long, not even a king spirit with nine of its gene locks open could escape such a thing. Seeing herself being drawn to the coin, she knew she'd be killed the moment she touched it. He really does want to kill me. Moment Queen then used her power to slow down everything around her. Then she sped herself up to attempt an escape. Unfortunately for her, even that was in vain. She was unable to escape the wretched suction the coin was producing. She was pulled towards it. Catcha. Moment Queen felt as if a mountain had been dropped on top of her, and she felt all her bones break. The coin then disappeared. She felt the weight quickly vanish after that, too. She was alive, but she was now little more than a crumpled sack of crushed bones on the ground. Well, why are you so weak? Hansen squatted down near her and shook his head. Moment Queen was infuriated by what he had done. If she wasn't trying to be nice, she would have tried to dodge and escape whatever he attempted to do earlier. Now that he had the audacity to insult her, she was furious. I really should have practiced with the blue dinosaur. This was a waste of time, eh? Hansen said as he turned to leave. Moment Queen then managed to wheeze out a few words, saying, Hold on. I'm not done yet. Moment Queen's bones had all been broken but somehow, she was still able to stand upright. As she shakily got back up to her feet, Hansen was more than surprised. It was as if time was going backwards, and the condition of her body was reverting to what it was before the coin ruined her. Her body was swiftly brought back to a good condition. Chapter 1193, I Get Half If there was one power Hansen was afraid of, it had to be time. Time and space were a freakish duo, but the former definitely made him the wariest. What it could achieve was both fascinating and frightening, and this was what Hansen thought as he looked at Moment Queen now. Humans could control space, but not time. They were not technologically advanced enough for time manipulation. In the sanctuary, things were a little different, and time there could be controlled, or at the very least manipulated. Moment Queen had not opened as many gene locks as Hansen had, but that didn't mean he was willing to underestimate her. Hansen formed another coin between his fingers, but before he could do anything, Moment Queen had already teleported in front of him and delivered a punch. She used to be a noble figure, one of divinity and grace. She had been disgraced repeatedly by her service to Hans Senator. The final straw was Hans Sen's insult, following her broken body. She could not take it anymore. Moment Queen attacked Hansen with all the power she had. She had to vent and release her pent-up frustration with him but she didn't think he'd kill her for the act. He'd have to keep her around for moving the shelter, after all. Hansen quickly used his phoenix techniques to avoid her thrashing. He knew he had avoided her, but in the next second, her wailing fists had become nothing but a blur. And somehow, she had managed to strike him in the stomach. Well, why are you so weak? Moment Queen wore a cheeky smirk. Moment Queen's powers were different than Sky King's, that much was certain. If she battled against Sky King, he'd have been able to kill her in one hit, but doing so would be difficult. Her unique talents most certainly gave her the ability to punch above her weight class. That's the spirit. Let's keep this going. Hansen activated his Dongshin Sutra and ran towards Moment Queen. Moment Queen twirled the dimension around them and got to fighting Han Sr. When it came to the manipulation of time, Moment Queen was in a league of her own. Even with a low amount of gene locks open, she was still frightening to compete with. Although she could not stop time, she could easily rewind the clock on her body and remove damage. She could speed up and slow down time, too, while giving her a separate flow to operate on. She was almost as good as Sky King in his ability of warping dimensions, despite the obvious gap in power that was between them. Hansen thought she could speed up time to predict the immediate future and what attacks might come her way, too. If that was true, that was similar to the falsified Sky Sutra. Moment Queen was still weak, though. If her talent would eventually lead to that ability, there was still some time to go. The ability to speed up time was already quite the showcase of someone's power, and if Hansen did not have Dong Shan Aura, he'd have been unable to dodge. Moment Queen kept on flashing before him with unrivaled speed. Even Hansen had to stay on his toes and remain sharp. But Moment Queen still kept missing him. He could see the dimension around her was being twisted as she went. I could hit him if I was just a little bit faster. Moment Queen was firing on all cylinders, but was just falling short of what was necessary to smack him silly. Believing herself to be too slow was just a misconception, though. That being said, 
it did drive her to give it everything she had. If she was able to move as fast as Sky King, there was no doubt she'd be able to strike Hansen however she wanted. But the Dongxian aura was giving Hansen the edge. By being able to predict her moves, he was evading her attacks before she even began executing them. Her speed wasn't quite the issue. At the very least, Hansen was now able to gauge how much power Moment Queen had amassed in the time they had been apart and see how far she'd come. While he had been gone, she had managed to open four gene locks. Wanting to keep things fair, Hansen made sure to only open four gene locks to compete. Two, with things like this, their powers were rather even, and balance was what Hansen wanted. He did everything he could to maintain the equal balance of the sparring session. From a spectator's point of view, all that could be seen were two wispy shadows brawling like mad in the martial hall. Now, Moment Queen discarded all attempts of maintaining a steady defense. She was now giving Hansen all she had, with all her focus placed in an attacking stance. Unlike Hansen, she could rewind. As such, Hansen would have to be put on the defensive. I can be faster. I know I can. There was only one thing occupying Moment Queen's mind, and that was the thought of beating the smirk off Hansen's ever smug face. Whoosh. Moment Queen felt like a chain had just broken inside her. Her fifth gene lock had now been opened. Her entire body became a blur before Han Sen, and he could no longer see her fist coming. Then, he was quickly walloped in the chest. Yes. Moment Queen was tremendously overjoyed. Very good. Moment Queen thought of following up the attack with another, but she was taken aback to see Han Sen praise, congratulate, and clap for her. You have opened five gene locks. It seems to me as if you have many King Spirit Geno points. I think it is time we make good on that deal. Do you remember? Hansen patted her on the shoulders and said, I get half. Moment Queen froze. Her excitement and happiness over managing to strike Hansen had all vanished. Chapter 1194 The Fourth Person in the Alliance Time King Spirit Geno Point Plus One Time King Spirit Geno Point Plus One Time King Spirit Geno Point Plus One Hansen, seeing his spirit Geno points increase, looked delightfully happy. Moment Queen wasn't feeling quite the same way, as could be imagined. She was fuming. She had managed to amass many time Geno points, but they were incredibly difficult to come by. And now, to see half of them go to Hansen, she felt as if her heart was physically bleeding. It looks like she managed to get herself a load of goodies in my absence. If she managed to open five Gene Locks, that means she must have received at least 500 self Geno points. I doubt ordinary King Spirits could achieve such a feat in such a small time frame, Hansen thought, as he pondered Moment Queen's situation. It was a shame they had signed a contract, though. This meant she could not give him any more than 100 Geno points. If Moment Queen was the one who held the contract and owned Hansen, then there'd be no limit. But, for obvious reasons, Hansen wouldn't place himself under contract with her. And for the time being, 100 of such Geno points were more than enough. When Moment Queen looked at Hansen next, there was a fire of murder in her eyes. Now that he had managed to obtain 100 Time King Spirit Geno points, Hansen was able to start producing his own skill. The Dongxian Sutra was able to simulate Sky King and Moment Queen's powers. But the Dongxian Sutra had only six of its tears open. There'd be a limit to the efficiency of his creation, and if he wasn't careful in the combination of those two volatile powers, there was a chance he could hurt himself. When Hansen created Saving Money, it was a long and laborious job that took him many years to complete. Returning to the Alliance, Hansen hopped onto Skynet. He wanted to increase his knowledge and learn all he could about space and time. He even consulted by Ishan about the subject. I focus on the human body. Space and time, well? That isn't exactly my forte. I suggest you go see Professor Long. He's an expert on the subject. Bai Ishan then provided Hansen with a slip of paper, before going on to say, he holds lectures regarding hypergeno arts that deal with space and time, primarily. Hansen filled out the application form, then Bai Ishan helped him fast-track the registration process. It was then that Hansen realized Professor Long was the creator of hyperspace, a tidbit of knowledge that greatly amped up his excitement. Due to this class being private for members of the St. Hall, it was held in their base. The knowledge to be shared there would undoubtedly be secret. As such, Hansen had to travel to Lyman Planet. It was a great distance away from Roka Planet, so to pass the time on the journey, 
Hansen decided to practice combat in the virtual community. Are you Hansen? Someone recognized him. Hansen turned around to see a modern-looking couple, both of whom were in their 20s. The girl happily ran towards Hansen, saying, Can I just say how much I love you? And she, Yin ran, Would it be boorish for me to request your signature? It'd be a pleasure. Hansen smiled. Here, on this sheet of paper, could you address it to Little Lawn? The girl had quickly lifted a notebook out of her pocket. Hansen wrote, To cute Little Lawn, Hans Sr. The girl thanked him and quickly left. I didn't know I had female fans. Hansen was pleased after this, so he trotted around with a spring in his step. But then, he overheard a conversation. Why did you ask for his signature? You do know he cannot fight anymore, right? The boyfriend told her. So? I think he's a lovely person, the girl said. Childish. The guy clearly didn't approve. Hansen, hearing this, did not mind too much. He wasn't a saint, and he knew he couldn't get everyone to like him. Hansen entered the holographic machine to practice combat and pass the time. Lyman was on the outskirts of the Alliance's system, so it was going to take half a month of travel for him to reach it. A lot of that time was spent in virtual fighting, but Hansen soon lost interest in it. Each fight was a cakewalk, and after winning every single match with the greatest of ease, he grew numb and bored. He wouldn't have spent time there if he had anything better to do. Just as Hansen was going to go off and watch the news, he was matched with someone a little out of the ordinary. Hansen was impressed by the fellow's name. Fourth person in the alliance, interesting. Hansen smiled when he saw the tag. If it was something something number one, Hansen wouldn't have been impressed. This, though, gave the impression he wasn't someone who was talking nonsense. This person exuded a feel that was real. Let me just see how strong this person is. Hansen chuckled to himself. Hansen was in social matchmaking, but there were rankings in play. He would only be able to match up with others of the same level, so in this case, other surpassers. When Hansen entered the arena, he did not hesitate to rush towards his opponent and unleash a flurry of attacks. When the dust settled, Hansen was shocked at the result. The opponent had successfully blocked each of his strikes. This person had to be special, as no one else could block Hansen's attacks like that. Hansen spent the next 10 minutes on the offensive but he was surprised to see his opponent successfully defend against every attack. Hansen was surprised, and he thought to himself, this guy really is something. Hansen's hands did not slow down, though. Instead, they just sped up. Chapter 1195, Textbook Example Fong Ming Kwan entered the virtual community and sent a message to Yuan Zhufeng. Fong Ming Kwan had scheduled an interview with Yuan Zhufeng, and despite the fact that they could only meet inside the virtual community, he had still been very excited for the occasion. Yuan Zhufeng was a demigod teacher, and he was so well-renowned, he had earned himself the title, Tutor of the Alliance. His primary field of teaching lay in hypergeno arts. He hadn't created any hypergeno arts himself, but he had formulated simpler varieties of some of the more complex ones that could be found. That way, those who weren't the brightest of bulbs could still participate, learn, and become stronger. Yuan Zhufeng's influence was sprawling, and he had garnered a great deal of respect over the years. He was so well-respected, he was given more credit than the original authors of hypergeno arts themselves. Over the years, though, his services had aided countless people, so it wasn't undeserving. Fang Mingquan was proud and honored to have been given the opportunity to interview someone of such prestige. Fang Mingquan, however, was soon surprised. He received a reply to the message he had sent and the answer was quite unexpected. I'm sorry. I am in a match, currently. I'll be available shortly. Fong Mingquan confirmed this in his online status, so without anything better to do, he decided to spectate. Fong Mingquan was quite curious over who the combatant was, who might have delayed him, and so he thought to himself, Old Yuan is having a match against someone? Could it be another demigod? Could it be Zhu Donglai? Fong Mingquan looked to his opponent and noticed they had hidden their ID. Fang Mingguan knew every person of Renown's ID, but without being able to see theirs now, he couldn't tell who Yuan Zhufeng's opponent was. The image of the opponent's face had been obscured, as well. As such, all that Fang Mingguan could learn about that person was the shape of their body. As the two fought intensely, Fang Mingguan reclined and made himself comfortable. He noticed that Yuan Zhufeng was being very defensive. Not that this came as a surprise. In fact, this was quite normal for Yuan Zhufeng. 
When he joined matchmaking, he did so to teach. He never fought an opponent with the desire to win. He only did so to encounter individuals with strength and teach them. From the way Yuan Zhifeng is defending, though, I can only suppose his opponent is of a lower tier, Fang Mingguan noticed. After a while of watching, a slow boiling shock began to alter his perception. Due to the fact he always watched matches and had developed great skills of analysis, he started to realize old Yuan's opponent's attacks were perfect. There was not a single flaw to witness in his abilities of combat. Before old Yuan, it was nearly impossible to remain perfect and flawless for a whole five minutes. Yuan Zhufeng, although his outward demeanor would not suggest it, was even more surprised than Fang Mingguan was. He thought he could kick back and relax for a while, matchmaking quickly through a number of people before the interview. And with Yuan Zhufeng's power, ending a fight when he wanted to shouldn't have been difficult. He had continued to defend against his manic opponent, in the hopes of spotting a flaw he could quickly exploit. There were still 15 minutes to go before the interview was supposed to start, though, so it wasn't as if he was late. Slowly, Yuan Jufeng's surprise turned to shock and a mild perspiration. He had difficulty believing how great and talented his opponent truly was. Fitness could always improve through the increase of Geno points, no matter how they were obtained or consumed. A person's abilities in combat were something else entirely, though, and they had to be properly learned. The opponent was not making use of anything special, but he truly moved like water. He was like a ribbon of silk on a gentle breeze, moving delicately and without the single shadow of an error. Or perhaps he was more of a machine, programmed to perform a move with the precision and finesse of a computer, devoid of flaws or human mistakes. Twenty minutes had elapsed, and Yuan Zhufeng was unable to notice a single error. He was going to stop the fight, due to the timer ending soon, but his curiosity had gotten the better of him. He wanted to see how long his opponent would last before making a mistake. Mistakes were inevitable, and they were a fault of the human condition. Everyone made mistakes, but his opponent was clearly something special. Yuan Zhufeng really wanted to see just how long his opponent would last. Hansen did not know he was fighting a demigod, but it felt as if he was getting nowhere, and each strike made zero progress. So strong. Hansen thought to himself. Easy wins had been boring him before this, though, and a good challenge was exactly what he had wanted. Yuan Zhifeng was exciting him quite a bit. Yuan Zhifeng's seemingly impenetrable defense was fascinating to Hansen, and Hansen wanted to see if he could eventually break it. Hansen used everything he had learned to fight, making every inch of his body a deadly weapon. Fang Mingguan was still in awe. It was as if he were watching a visual, fighting textbook spring to life with a rehearsed and choreographed fight that seemed too good to be true. The person on the offense and the person on the defense were both perfect in everything they sought to do. The skills and techniques performed weren't particularly special, but both of them together in perfect harmonious combat was strikingly unique and infinitely riveting to watch. It was a sheer spectacle to witness, no doubt. He had never seen anything like it. Every human's body was different. A strong, chunky body could not make use of soft and delicate skills. It was not uncommon to see muscular men fail to bend and weave with the finesse of someone who was thinner and thus more agile. Hansen was an exception to this rule, though, it seemed. It didn't matter what skill Hansen performed or which way he attacked. He was perfect. This was why Yuan Zhufeng almost mistook him for a computer. The precision of his fighting was almost inhuman. Chapter 1196, You Were Hansen? As the march of time went on, so did Hansen's ravenous barrage of attacks. His opponent was like a tumbler doll, refusing to fall over no matter how hard or how quickly Hansen struck. Even while channeling all his powers of prediction, he simply couldn't find a way to knock him down. Hansen was actually shocked by what was going on. Yuan Zhifeng was just as shocked. They had been going at it like this for one hour, and Hansen had yet to make a single misstep or produce a move that featured a flaw. Yuan Zhufeng was reducing his own abilities to match with his opponent, but he was starting to worry. Yuan Zhufeng was strong, but he was a human, after all. Even he could make a mistake after such a long, intense session that required absolute focus. And while he had been waiting for his opponent to make a mistake, he was starting to have the sneaking suspicion that this was what his opponent was waiting for, as well. They were both in on the game, waiting to see who would be the first to slip up. Yuan Zhufeng no longer treated Hansen like a junior. 
He fought as seriously as he could and took him as a real challenger. Yuan Zhifeng was having to use every ounce of his power to stay strong, and he'd have to continue to do so if he wanted to emerge victorious. Fang Mingguan was in awe. It was only supposed to be a casual, social match. He never expected to watch a balls-to-the-wall, high-octane match such as this, given the circumstances. Amidst the dizzying array of skills consistently being cast, Fang Mingguan was only able to recognize around 1 in 10. And before he could finish blinking to acknowledge a skill, another flurry of attacks and defensive skills had been flung. Fang Mingguan knew his knowledge was lacking as he watched this battle between two hardcore elites. He was glad he had been recording the match, though. Once it was over, he'd be looking forward to a steady and studious rewatch. Although he couldn't fight very well himself, it was always an admirable trait of Fong Mingguan that his passion for combat never waned. It enthralled him, despite his lack of participation. The fight was frightening to watch, and it kept its spectators on the edge of their seats. It was one that required a constant, pinpoint precise usage of stamina and endurance to maintain a status quo that could collapse at any minuscule miscalculation. Any who were to watch it would know that and it imbued the atmosphere with a feeling of dread and unease. One attack, followed by one defense. Whoever made a mistake first would be the loser. After three hours, there was still no change. But Yuan Zhufeng's gentle perspiration had turned to him full on sweating bullets. This fight was no longer taxing on the body, it was exhausting to the mind. His opponent continued to show no sign of human emotion, and it continued its assault with the cold lethality of a machine built to destroy. Yuan Zhufeng was starting to fear he'd be unable to keep up, and that he'd make a mistake any second now. Who is this man? Who can have such a vast amount of power and stamina? Yuan Zhufeng thought to himself. He was well acquainted with many of the elites that populated the alliance, but his opponent was not someone he recognized. Rack his mind as he might, he just couldn't think of anyone who fit the bill. But he didn't think he was just some nobody, either. Anyone who possessed that much power must have some manner of renown. Fong Mingguan had been there, staring intently for the past three hours. He was as captivated as ever. Still, he was starting to feel exhausted, more so than the fighters that were actually engaged in the battle. And just as Fong Mingguan thought this fight would go on for another eternity and a day, an explosion sounded. Yuan Zhufeng used his arms to block the incoming fist, but when the dust settled, he had lost. Impossible. He blocked the punch, but he lost? Fang Mingxuan's face had twisted into an expression of utter disbelief. Seeing Yuan Jufeng's virtual body outside the battleground, Fang Mingquan had to immediately ask, Old Yuan, did you encounter a glitch? Old Yuan gave a wry smile and answered, I lost. He is not only strong of body, grand power resides in every aspect of that person. He's powerful overall? Fang Mingquan wasn't entirely sure what he was being told. Old Yuan did not elaborate any further, though. Instead, he sent an invitation to his opponent to request a meet. Who is your opponent? Do you know? Was he a demigod? Fang Mingguan believed his opponent had to be someone of a comparable level. Old Yuan smiled and admitted, I don't know who he is, but believe me when I tell you that he is just a surpasser. A surpasser? Fang Mingguan was shocked, and he partially believed his ears had been fibbing. It was more than a surprise to hear a surpasser had beaten Old Yuan, even if he had weakened himself to compete. Fang Mingguan wished to say something more, but all of a sudden, the opponent arrived to greet them. You are so strong. My name is Yuan Zhifeng. Can we be friends so that we may compete again sometime? Yuan Zhifeng gave a gentle, heartfelt smile. Hansen was surprised. He knew who Yuan Zhifeng was, but he never expected that was the person he had spent the past three hours fighting against. I appreciate your compliments. Hansen then showed him his ID and name, then added him as a friend. Hansen respected his elders a great deal, particularly those that had done great services for humanity in their time. Hansen was not opposed to telling people he had healed, either. You are Hansen. Fong Minkwan unwittingly blasted, while Yuan Zhufeng beside him was still deep in thought. It was shocking to see him there fighting like that as many demigods had believed his condition to be beyond repair. Although they had never met before, Yuan Zhufeng knew exactly who he was. You are healed? Yuan Zhufeng asked, with visible surprise. Almost. Hansen smiled. He wished to say more, but all of a sudden, he disconnected from Skynet and disappeared. Morning. Morning. 
Universe is under attack. All passengers of Universe, please proceed to the evacuation terminal. The hologram disconnected and then all doors opened. From beyond, the blaring sounds of a siren raised everyone to their feet and incited panic. Boom. The ship called Universe was shaken, causing everything to be cast around in disarray. It was as if something had rammed the ship. Boom. 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 It kept going, as if a cannon was repeatedly firing at the ship. Chapter 1197 Shura Ship The ship was rattling and shaking like mad, as passengers scrambled in their attempts to reach the panic terminal. Fortunately, most of the people on board were humans with a good fitness level. They were unfazed and unshaken by the sudden bombardment from a hostile force. Before Hansen could exit the hologram lobby, he saw the girl who had asked him for a signature make her way out alongside her boyfriend. They were both young, and neither of them was an evolver yet. Due to their inexperience, they struggled to maintain calm in the face of what had assuredly ruined their day. Hansen approached them, wanting to guide them to safety. The panic terminal was the sturdiest location of the ship. It was designed for an event such as this, as it had been built to withstand the crumbling of the entire battleship and to deflect can of fire that was aimed directly at it. It also served as a large evacuation pod. Their ship was now in the farthest reaches of the Alliance's system. It was on the outskirts of human-inhabited space, the edge of the bubble. It wasn't near the Shura, but it was a mostly uncharted, rarely visited pocket of the Black. Interstellar pirates frequented such desolate strips of space, so this attack did not come as a complete surprise. The universe had to divert away from the course it had been following. If things continued, this could end poorly. If they were being attacked by pirates, they would probably be all right. Pirates were thieves, and if the universe was boarded, then they would only want to steal valuables. Hansen had an ace up his sleeve, unbeknownst to everyone, though. He had the black beetle with him and he could use that to slip into space and destroy the attackers with ease. Even the infamous pirate Minotaur only had three star-class ships. A threat such as that would be nothing for the Black Beetle. For now, though, Hansen was going to cover the couple in their rush to safety. All of a sudden, an extra-large explosion struck the ship. A hole had formed in the hull, producing a large amount of suction, pulling everything out into space. Surpassers could not survive in space, only demigods. The couple were unable to grab a hold of anything to prevent themselves from being pulled out into the black. Hope of survival seemed bleak, and Hansen witnessed the pain and realization of what was coming across their expressions. He was not willing to let them go. Hansen went into the suck stream, donning armor and a winged beast soul to aid him. Then, he activated his nine gene locks of the Blood Pulse Sutra. The couple, by this point, had been pulled outside the ship. They were sure death would come for them. And with the ship still moving, at the speed they were going, it seemed impossible for them to get back inside. They continued to flail in an attempt to grab a hold of something, but they couldn't. Out in space, their lives were now at the mercy of fate. But then, a red shadow with draconic wings flickered past their eyes. Amidst their shock at what had just occurred, they struggled to comprehend anything. But something familiar appeared directly before each of them. There was a hand, one for each of them to grab. They couldn't see who it was, but the arm seemed to be the only thing near enough to grab. So they did. Boom. All of a sudden, it felt as if they had been wrapped up in the warm embrace of a friendly dragon. They heard the wings flap in their ears, and they watched as they were brought back into the safety of the ship. With the incredible speed they were traveling at, they were able to push through the suction that sought to keep them out. The couple could not believe what they were seeing. In a situation such as that, Demigods were the likeliest people to risk life and limb going out into the black physically to save others. Surpassers were almost guaranteed to die. So, the person who saved them must have been incredibly powerful. The couple were shocked but honored to have been saved by someone with such strength. Hansen held the couple tightly and continued flapping his wings to defy the vacuum. Then, Hansen reached the controls for sealing the hull with an emergency panel and repressurized the room. He pushed the button. Thank you so much. They both thanked Hansen profusely. Hansen put away his beast souls and then guided them to the panic terminal. At its entrance, he told them, get in there. It's not safe elsewhere. It's you. The boy could hardly believe his eyes, recognizing his savior had been Hans Sr. The girl's face was one of utter surprise, too. Hansen didn't pay them any mind, though. He had been able to glimpse a lot when he allowed himself to be pulled out into space. 
there was an entire fleet of Shura ships outside. There were two that were star class, amidst an armada of many others. And that was all Han Sen was able to see in his brief look outside. There had to be many more he hadn't been able to catch sight of. Hansen now knew they weren't up against pirates. This was a proper military force, an entire arm of the Shura's military. A small passenger ship, such as the one they were on, had no hope of survival. If the Shura wanted to, they could blow up the universe any second. But what may have been stranger was what had prompted such an attack. It was strange for the Shura to attack so aggressively with a large military force, despite the uneasy establishment of a ceasefire. Why would they come for a small passenger ship such as that? When they attacked Universe, they had exposed themselves, though. Hansen might have understood if they wanted to attack a large alliance fortress by surprise. But that element seemed to have been squandered, now that they had chosen to pepper the Universe with a small amount of fire. The Alliance was guaranteed to have heard what was going on by now, and the Shura were most likely aware of this. For that reason, there had to be something on the Universe they desperately desired. Chapter 1198 Old Alloy Box After Hansen took the couple to the panic terminal, the Shura ship started firing once more. This time, however, there were more misses than hits, and it gave them the uneasy feeling they were being issued a warning. If the Shura had been attacking for real, the universe wouldn't have lasted more than a second. Little Yen, are you okay? After entering the panic terminal, an old man grabbed the girl and worry. Grandpa, I'm fine. Hansen saved me and Ling Yuan both, the girl told him. The old man thanked Hansen profusely, but Hansen had more on his mind right now, and he didn't have the time to hang around and indulge any further social niceties. Understanding the situation better than anyone, he wanted to ask the captain what the ship was transporting in the cargo docks. Before Hansen left, a person approached with a few more stragglers. This person was dressed in the uniform of a captain, and he said, Old Sue, the Shura have us surrounded. I don't think the panic terminal was built to withstand the pounding of an armada's fire and take us to our proposed destination. We must proceed to the next step, asset denial. We will destroy the information. It was then that Hansen noticed the old man was clutching an alloy box. It was fairly modern in its design, but it looked weathered and worn, as if it was a few decades old. Hansen felt as if he had seen a similar box elsewhere. No, this is irreplaceable, the old man pleaded, as his grip on the box tightened. Old Sue, we cannot be saved. Hope is lost. All we can do now is make the most of our predicament by preventing the Shura from obtaining this item. I apologize but this is how it must be. The captain gestured with his hand, prompting soldiers to come forward and try to seize the box. I remember. Hansen remembered where he had seen this box before. It was an old box, one whose trays could not even be found on Skynet. He had seen it in the sanctuary. When Hansen first met Zero in the cave, he saw an identical box there, except it was broken. Looking at this box before him, Hansen knew they had to be the same model. Hansen also remembered he found a Geno solution and some information inside it. Hansen never figured out what that information dictated, so he had it hidden. It was all coming back to him, now that he was seeing that box. If there was a connection between the two, Hansen could not tell just yet. After all, the box itself wasn't particularly remarkable. Two of the soldiers were now directly in front of the old man, who had yet to flinch. His grip on the box only tightened. Old Sue. I am sorry. You know I wouldn't let it come to this if there was another way. Another round of explosions echoed around the ship, prompting him to gesture for the soldiers to hurry. They both grabbed the old man and removed the box from his grasp. The old man looked very upset, but he didn't resist too much. A soldier tried to open the box but found out he was unable to. Old Sue, the captain shouted. The old man then sighed, providing the soldier a key card to open it. The soldier used it, and the box opened successfully. Hansen looked at the now open box and was delivered quite the shock. Inside, there was a bottle. A bottle and information. The bottle was the same one Hansen had found. The box is the same. The bottle is the same. No way the solution inside can be the same, can it? Hansen thought to himself. The soldier opened the box and brought a punch down on the bottle with a fire wreathed fist. Hansen watched the events intensely. The soldier was a surpasser and with a fire element attack, the box was sure to be destroyed. If Hansen hadn't seen that bottle, he wouldn't have cared too much. 
but he wanted to learn more, so he ran before the soldier, blocked his fist, and grabbed the box himself. Ping. The hot flames came down on Han Sen's hand like a meteor that spewed lava, but he was undamaged. Everyone was shocked, and the rest of the ship's personnel all aimed their weapons at Han Sen, thinking he was a threat. You are a traitor. You are working for the Shura, the captain asked, with half a rhetorical tone. I am Han Sen, and my wife is Ji Yanran. Ji Ruajin is my father-in-law, Han Sen quickly stated, raising his hands in innocence. Hansen didn't think the laser guns could hurt him too much, but he didn't want to risk having to fight humans. Being a relative of President G had its perks. When he said this, everyone stopped and lowered their guns. Then, they all pointed at Hans Sr. You're Hansen? the captain asked. Yes, Hansen answered. Yes, he is Hansen. And he just saved our lives, Sulan proclaimed. Regardless of who you are, you cannot interfere with our task. It is imperative we stop this box and its contents from falling into enemy hands. We must destroy it, the captain exclaimed. Seeing the way the captain held himself, it didn't seem likely he'd care too much, even if Han Sin was the president's father. It was his task to destroy the box and its items, and he wasn't going to let anything get in the way of that. Boom. Another explosion sounded, as a wide hole was punched through the hole of the panic terminal. The Shura were going to board. Chapter 1199, Shura The Shura that boarded the ship were all wearing the same armor. Aspects that often revealed their level, such as horns and faces, had been hidden. Only one of them stood out from the crowd. He was dressed in armor that was a far more glamorous and a far more intimidating sight. Presumably, this figure was the leader. The Shura in the front were holding energy shields. The humans inside all looked dismayed thinking they were all to be killed by the ruthless Shura that had come for them. The captain gritted his teeth and fired his gun at the box which was still in Hansen's possession. Hansen knew he was going to do this, so he was quick to react and avoid the shot hitting its target. Ping! The laser beam hit the ground, forming a scorch mark. If I give this to you, will you let me live? Hansen asked the Shura boss, holding the box up. Everyone was angered by this action, not expecting Hansen, of all people to betray them so casually. Rebel scum. Kill him. We cannot let that box fall into Shura possession. The captain issued the command without hesitation, prompting everyone to turn their weapons on Hansen and attempt to gun him down. The lasers came at Hansen like the passing of stars, but they did little to stop him. Hansen was able to duck, dodge, bob, and weave his way around every shot. The Shura leader made a gesture, telling his shield-bearing men to provide him protection. Ping. 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 The rest of the laser hits pinged off the energy shields. The power of the shots was not enough to break them. It was only just a passenger ship, after all. The most high-tech weaponry was not given to traditionally uneventful cruise personnel. Hansen ran into the middle of the Shura horde, wanting to give the box to the leader. I will give this to you if you spare my life, Hansen said, with a trembling voice. The leader took the box from Hansen with visible glee. Tracking down the box had caused them a lot of trouble and grief. It made them exuberantly happy to see a human hand deliver it for them. The leader did not care much for Hansen, though. He thought the human looked young and weak. And with the humans wanting to kill Hansen for real, he was able to tell this was not an act. The leader followed his instincts, which were telling him Hansen genuinely wished to help, even if it was for his own benefit. He didn't think Hansen harbored any malcontent. A pathetic human, the leader thought. But Hansen had done him a service, after all. The leader accepted the box, but in the next moment, a copper dagger was plunged into the Shura's chest. Katcha. The armor he wore was unable to provide an adequate defense against the power of that strike. A second later, Hansen turned red, as wings sprouted from his back in a glorious display. In his hand, a copper dagger was clenched tightly. The leader threw a punch towards Hansen's face with ferocious, terrible power. The Shura were powerful beings, and it usually took a lot more than a stab to stop them from being able to fight. The rest of the Shura then turned to fire at Han Sr. Hansen didn't care too much about them, though. He dodged the punch and evaded every single laser. He ducked his head as one last laser whipped past his face. The soldier had only missed that shot because he didn't want to hit the leader. Hansen pulled out Taya and drew back closer to the Shura leader. The Shura leader cared nothing for the wound he had suffered, and with the box in one hand, 
he threw a whole bunch of punches towards Hansen with the other. Again, Hansen was able to dodge the punches with relative ease, all the while avoiding the lasers blasting in his direction. With Taya in his left hand, Hansen hopped and sliced it across the leader's throat. The leader was still standing, but only just. He wished for nothing more right now than to grab Hansen by his neck and snap it. Hansen spun around, dodging the feeble attempts of the dying leader, and continued to evade the laser fire. He went around the leader and cast Blood Pulse Sutra as he went. Taya returned to dig a trench across the other half of the leader's neck. And this time, the entire head left the quivering body. It went flying up into the sky, casting blood across the room as it went. Hansen took the box back and kicked the headless body into the crowd that still sought to gun him down. This had all happened in a short amount of time, and the humans who were now watching barely had time to acknowledge what had transpired. They almost didn't realize Hansen had spun a yarn to trick the leader and behead him. The moment Hansen kicked the body, though, he disappeared from sight. The Shura were now in chaos. The blood of their leader had them at a loss, and they grimaced at how quickly the tables had turned. Chapter 1200 The Reaper's Busy Day The captain was frozen when Hansen reappeared. He flashed between being visible and invisible, as each reappearance coincided with a strike that brought several Shura soldiers down in a haze of blood and pain screams. The Shura that were still standing fired their weapons as they had been doing the entire time, but it was as if they were firing blanks. Despite the barrage of laser fire that was being cast each second, none of the shots were able to find their target. The panic terminal was blackened by the laser scorch marks. Hansen was like the Reaper himself, come to make good on a quota that had fallen far behind. His harvest of Shura was grand, but terrifying to behold. One by one, under Hansen's sword scythe, the Shura fell and submitted to the cold clasp of death. The captain and old Sue were not soldiers, but the men under their command were. They already had their guns out, firing at the Shura to aid Han Sr. Get to cover or get down. We're lighting this place up, a soldier exclaimed at the top of his lungs as he squeezed the trigger of his blaster. The captain, guards, and passengers all fell back and got to cover. The formation and planned tactics of the Shura had fallen to ruin within moments of letting Hansen into the middle. They were in disarray, with no clue how to respond. It was utter anarchy. Hansen slew a few more shield bearers after killing the leader, resulting in a complete collapse of their immediate chain of command. They were headless chickens, and all they could think to do was to try to kill the man who had brought ruin to their plants. But Hansen was like a ghost, and no matter what they tried to do, they could not hit him. More Shura soldiers came on board as backup, but they were just meat for the grinder. Hansen thought to speed things up, so he summoned a copper knight and a stunning angel to join him in his running riot. The angel of death moved her hand, then soared into the midst of the soldiers, cleaving a bloody path as she went. She swung her great sword as chunks of flesh and ribbons of entrails curtained and showered her as if in celebration of the feat. Disloyal Knight was no slouch, either. He used his halo to suppress the soldiers and make them move even slower. Hansen left a few of the Shura soldiers behind for the other humans to deal with as he pushed forward with Taya to clear a path. There were many Shura soldiers waiting for him, but the corridors were narrow and they couldn't respond very well to the threat that was bearing down on them. When the human soldiers finished up the final few Shura, they wanted to follow Hans Senator they took off after him. But when they turned the corner to look down the corridor Hansen had gone, all they saw was a dim, red tunnel of death and destruction. The human soldiers were shocked and even disgusted by the ghastly sight of all the dead Shura that had been mercilessly slaughtered by Hans Sr. Who said this guy's a cripple? The captain gasped. This lad could very well be a demigod, but old Sue sighed. Everyone understood what he was going to say. No matter how strong Hansen was, the Shura he was slaying were a fraction of the fleet at large. The ship was still surrounded by an armada and countless thousands of Shura. If the Shura didn't get what they wanted, Universe was doomed. Not even Hansen could survive in space, so they were still at a grave disadvantage. I'll kill as many as I can, a soldier solemnly said. For as long as he drew breath, he wouldn't run. He would march into the maw of hell itself if it meant buying as much time as possible and bringing down a bunch of ox men with him. The two soldiers ran down the corridor, trampling the fallen Shura as they went. The floor was too littered to avoid this. When they turned the next corner, the same horrific sight greeted their eyes. 
The captain and passengers followed from behind. 2. Ling Yuan felt like throwing up when he saw Han Sen's work. A stomach-churning mixture of fear and excitement spun in everyone's bowels as they treaded those murder halls. Hansen killed all these? Ling Yuan asked. A man who he had not believed to be special had suddenly become a deity of death. He had killed a lot in a gruesome way, but Ling Yuan couldn't help but admire Hansen for sticking it to the Shura. Old Su said, I have seen many strong surpasses in my time, but never before have I seen one wield this much power. If he doesn't get himself killed, he might very well become the second god's lair. The captain gave a wry smile and said, It's a crying shame he has to die with us lot, out here in the armpit of the system. Tis a crying shame. The two soldiers in the front moved forward in silence. They couldn't find Han sound, but it was easy enough to follow what was left in his wake. A door eventually barred their passage. There was a window next to it, and when they looked through, they saw the boarding craft that had latched itself onto the universe through the hole they had punched through the hole. Hansen was nowhere to be seen, though. Where is he? Where did he go? Sulan asked as her eyes scoured the limited view the windows provided. It is space out there. If you can't see him, I'm afraid. The soldier's grim suggestion faded without finishing, but everyone knew what he meant. Look, a passenger shouted from the observation deck. Everyone looked to where the passenger was pointing. They all went over to join him, since the radar was broken, and they would have to use their eyes if they wished to know what was waiting for them outside in the black. That place was supposed to be a simple sightseeing platform. You could see nothing but a black screen from the outside, but from the inside, you could see everything. And what was transpiring out there was not what they had expected. 